Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, mori mori wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you would join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Himalaya, Ghana, wherever you find your podcast. And also, please be sure to tell all of your family and friends. Our guest today is Melissa Stewart. She is here today to celebrate mega predators of the past. Before we invite Melissa into the studio, we want to let you know about some of the great things that are coming up on the Reading With Your Kids podcast during the holiday season. On Christmas Day, members of the Catholic Teen Authors Group, CatholicTeenAuthors.com, they'll be joining us once again. They have a brand new original short story. It's called St. Nicholas Eve. They're going to be here to read that. It's going to be one. It, 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 it's a wonderful, wonderful story. It's really fun. You're going to love it. You're going to be moved. On Christmas Eve and the day after Christmas, we're also going to look back at some of the other original Christmas stories that were created for the podcast. Uh, another one by our Catholic teen author friends and also from our friends from Spooky Middle Grade Books. And on January 1st, here on the Reading With Your Kids podcast, we're going to be launching the first episode of Drawing With Your Kids. Nick Yulo is going to be our guest. So that's all happening in the next couple of weeks here at the Reading With Your Kids podcast. The best way to make sure you don't miss anything is to subscribe. And you can subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcast. And of course, you can also find us at readingwithyourkids.com. Join us right now from the beautiful state of Massachusetts. Our guest is returning today to celebrate her brand new book. It's called Mega Predators. Please welcome back to the show, Melissa Stewart. Hey, Melissa, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Wonderful. Wonderful. It's so great to have you back on. You were um, on the podcast when we first launched many years ago. Uh, You're a fantastic STEM writer, you have this um, amazing um, library of books that that you've written cover, covering the STEM topics. I can't wait for you to tell us what Mega Predators is all about. Yeah, so my new book, Mega Predators of the Past, is a little bit different. You might initially think that it's about dinosaurs, but it's actually about other kinds of creatures that are big and ferocious and lived a long time ago. So it's perfect for kids who know everything about dinosaurs already you can sort of expand their thinking with this book and it's written in kind of a fun lively voice the narrator takes the point of view that uh, dinosaurs are overexposed and overrated and so now these creatures deserve their moment in the sun and it includes things like giant ripper lizards and terror birds that are as tall as giraffes and scorpions that are three feet long. So lots of giant creatures. Wow, wow. So I'm trying to get the timeline in my head. Dinosaurs were walked the earth millions of years ago, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. These predators, when are we talking these predators? So some of them were alive at the same time as the dinosaurs. And in fact, some of them come before the dinosaurs. And the, so there's the giant giant dragonflies, which are, their wings are about three feet long. They lived about 420 million years ago, so that's before dinosaurs. There are also some, the scorpions that I was mentioning before. They lived about 320 million years ago, so also before dinosaurs. But then there are also some creatures like American lions that lived at the same time as early humans. So there's a full range in terms of time period. Wow. You 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 know dragonflies are kind of terrifying as they are. I I know, I know they're they're harmless and and I've appreciated the beauty of them, but you know when you see them 
looking like a helicopter with this big long thing in the back that looks like a stinger and um they can be pretty frightening now when they're teeny weeny i can't imagine a dragonfly with three foot long wings and i imagine the, the rest of the body must be equally ginormous yes yes yeah. and they ate all kinds of insects there were other there were a lot of large insects at that period of time and the dragonflies were sort of the, the king of the heap at that point now i understand we we know about the dinosaurs because we found uh, dinosaur bones uh, dragonflies how do we find out about the dragonflies and scorpions are the same way are there have, have they been fossilized so sometimes they have created imprints that people will crack open a rock and then on each side you can see the imprint of its body but also with dragonflies there have been remains of them in amber which is it was sap from a, a tree in the pine conifer family that uh, the the it would create these big kind of drops of amber that would crystallize over time would fossilize over time wow wow that must have been an awful lot of amber to cover up a big giant dragonfly yeah it didn't necessarily cover their entire body it mm -hmm. might have just been a crumpled up ring or a leg or something like that um, so I, I'm not sure that there's a piece of amber with an entire dragonfly body. That you're right, that would be gigantic. Yeah. And you mentioning um, American lions. Um, uh, is this similar to the African lions with the mane and the ferocious roar? And they're similar. They're about twice as big as African lions, wow. and they just like their name says, they lived in the Americas, and so and at the time of early humans, and so. There were probably occasions where some people were meeting them in dark caves, and that probably didn't turn out too well for the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that, I, you just sent shivers up my spine meeting a <laughs> lion in a dark cave. Ooh. Wow. Where did you get the inspiration to write this book? So the idea for this book actually came, I was reading an article uh, about Titanoboas, which is, that's one of the mega predators we haven't discussed yet. So imagine snakes, boa constrictor like snakes that were 43 feet long. So that's basically two cars parked end to end is about 40 feet. So that gives you a sense of how big these snakes were. I read an article about them in Scientific American. And I was fascinated, but there wasn't enough information about a whole book. So I ripped the article out of the magazine and I stuck it to the idea board in my office. And then over time, I started to kind of collect other ideas, other really big prehistoric creatures. And eventually I had enough for a book. Wow, wow. Now, you didn't rip it out of like a, a magazine at a doctor's office, did you? No, no, it's my husband's subscription. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been known to do that. Um, this is, uh, I, I love, I'd lo love to talk a little bit about the, the process you shared with us. You know, that this, the, the, the first spark for the book was this one little article and it wasn't enough to, for, for a whole book, but you, you, you got it there. One of the things that makes, drives my beautiful wife crazy is that I'll have an idea. And I'll be gung ho on it, and you know, do this work, and then I'll, something else shiny will kind of distract me, and I'll go over there, and I can't never get back to it. How do you kind of organize yourself or train yourself to like? I have this idea, and it's not ready for me to jump into right now, but I'm I'm going to put it here and work on other things, and then just add to this, you know, day by day or month by month. Um, to, to get the book done. Uh, tell me a little bit about that so I can be more organized and get to some of those ideas that I've left by the wayside. I, yeah, that's a great question. I think this idea board that I have, it's really a key piece of my writing. And it so some people keep a vision board and the idea is that things that they might want to try to bring into their life, they will create this bulletin board or this poster with images of all of those. And I sort of like that. I have, whenever, whenever I have ideas, things that I'm really interested in writing about, I will put it up, uh, put some kind of representation of it up on the idea board 
and then it's right in front of my computer every day. So I look up at it every day and I see it there. And that sort of helps me to remember the things that I'm trying to focus on that are maybe not front and center right now, but that still sort of need to be um, kicking around in the back of, back of my mind. And so that allows me when I then read about, let's say, another mega predator to remember, oh, I'm collecting these and let's add it to that example or those examples that I already have. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What a great idea. I, I, I was just speaking to um, another author, and he was telling me how he's reading four books at a time. You know, read a chapter and then do something, read another chapter from a, a, another book. Um, and and that, that makes a lot of sense. I, you know, initially it was like, wow, how can you focus on all these, you know, on, on multiple books at the same time? But we're doing that every day. I mean, it's... No problem for somebody to sit down and watch two or three TV shows in an evening and be able to keep up with it. So, um, yeah, we can definitely work on different things at different times. Sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What is it about the STEM field that it, it really excites you when it comes to writing? I think for me, I was always a science kid. In fact, I was interested in science long before I had any inkling that I might become a writer as a career. Um, and I think it traces all the way back to when I was a child. My dad would take my brother and I on walks in the woods, and he would introduce us to the things around us. And that's really when I was hooked on science and the natural world, and I have carried that with me my whole life. You know, Rachel Carson had a quote where she said something like, science gives me something to write about, and I feel exactly the same way. I like that. I like that. Science gives me something to write about. Yeah, yeah. We you talked uh, about a few pre- predators: the scorpion, the dragonfly, the boa constrictor, the lion. What was the most frightening predator that you write about? I think the most frightening one is megalodon. So megalodon was an ancient shark that was mm. three times bigger than a great white shark. And can you imagine if that creature was still alive today? Wow. Yeah, yeah. Imagine walking on the beach uh, on Cape Cod and finding one of those stranded on the beach. Yeah. Wow. So what happened to these, um, you know, we have this idea that, you know, maybe an asteroid hit and that's what happened to the dinosaurs. Um, What happened to these creatures that came later? Yeah, so the, some of these creatures that were earlier, some of them that were later that have gone extinct, scientists don't really know all the answers to that. I think there are a number of times when Earth's temperature has either um, gone significantly higher or gone significantly lower and creatures can't survive. Sometimes that's the relate of um, extreme volcanic activity. There have been other times when major... Um, bodies from outer space, either comets or or asteroids have hit and um, caused extinctions. But then there are also other animals that have just gone extinct gradually for either reasons that we do know or we don't know. Mm-hmm. But the thing that is exciting about the end of mega predators of the past is it talks about the biggest predator to ever live, which is still alive today, the blue whale. I never think of a whale as a predator. Well, blue whales eat krill, which Mm -hmm. are tiny little shrimp, but they're still predators. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and since they're eating a bazillion of them every day, they're they're serial predators. That's right, Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, wow. What is it? Do you have a favorite mega predator uh, that that you came across in your in your research? I think the Titanoboa would have to be my favorite, just because it's hard to really imagine. I I kind of creeped out by snakes, uh-huh. and so it's hard to imagine encountering a snake that big. Mm-hmm. They they are boa constrictors are huge, and to think about one that is the size of, you know, as long as two cars, that's, um, yeah. and, and so it must, must have weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds. 
get thousands. And the, so the biggest boa constrictors alive today are perhaps eight feet. So we're talking about something five times bigger mm-hmm. than the big, uh, biggest boa constrictor imaginable. Wow. And what was that bird that you mentioned that was as tall as a giraffe? Yeah, so those are giant terror birds, and they lived in what is now South America, and they ate pretty much anything they wanted. I they had giant beaks um, that they used as they, – they had very sharp edges, and they kind of used it like a knife. Wow. Now, I in, – in, in Central America, we saw a harpy eagle, which I think is six feet tall, which uh, is pretty terrifying. I can't imagine a creature like that, a bird like that, being as tall as a giraffe. That would, um, yeah, I, that would make me go back inside that cave with the lion, potentially. Yeah, they were about 15 feet tall, and they weighed something like 400 or 500 pounds. Wow. Now, did yeah. any of the mega predators kind of evolve into a less dangerous, less frightening version of itself? Yeah, that's a good question. So the mega predators that are in this book are actually either related to animals that are alive today or have body features that are very similar to animals that are alive today. So it's a way that they're different from dinosaurs, um, that the dinosaurs, except birds, are long gone, and there's really nothing quite like them that exists today. But, you, you know, you have the giant terror bird, and it's really not all that different in some ways from, let's say, an ostrich. Or you have a giant ripper lizard, which is not all that different from today's Komodo dragon. Wow. Wow. That is um, amazing. Boy, oh boy. Now, were there any creatures that you had heard of that you weren't able to find enough information about to include in the book? Yeah, there were some that scientists sort of disagree about exactly how big they were. And so one was the devil frog, which originally I wanted to include. And it was probably, I don't know, about the size of a bread box. So imagine a imagine a, a frog that was that big. Um, and it, it fed on all kinds of things. But there really wasn't enough information. And there was also some information about giant apes, but it wasn't quite clear what they ate back then so I'm not so sure if they were eating I, I think they may have been eating a combination of um, of plants and animals so they would be more of an omnivore than a predator mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now you were talking about you know the fact that lots of kids are fascinated by dinosaurs and that the narrative of narrator of your book are saying that the dinosaurs are kind of overexposed and um, my son certainly was fascinated um, and obsessed with dinosaurs, not so much my daughter. Is that something that you find, you know, that, that, that it's typically boys that are, that are fascinated with, with dinosaurs and not so much girls, or is, it, or, or is that changing? You know, I, I think that it is something you find, but it's one of those questions that you have to ask. Is that a result of society, the mm-hmm. way that children are socialized, where most children are taught that certain things are for boys and certain things are for girls, or is that a natural inclination? I think there, there's certainly, I've certainly run into girls that are dinosaur mm-hmm. obsessed and I've run into boys that are dinosaur obsessed. It's hard, you know, it's hard to answer questions like these. Yeah. But yeah. I do think they're worth asking. Yeah, it, it's 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 fascinating that um that you, and especially I mean the dinosaur thing is and and I know that I was pretty obsessed with dinosaurs growing up. Um what do you think what do you think it is about these creatures that were really terrifying and that lived so long ago uh, that it, you know, really distant from us that that fascinates, especially young kids, but but uh, adults too. I think they just really capture our imagination of to think about what life on Earth was like at one point, and you know, who knows what it could potentially be like at some point in the future. 
I, you know, I think, and I think they're so big. And I think also the way that they have been portrayed in the media and in films like Jurassic Park um, just makes them something that, that kids and adults are really curious about and want to know more about. Yeah. And they're definitely going to want to know more about the, the less celebrated creatures and predators. Um, and that's something that you do great in mega predators of the past. I, can can we ask? And I know I'm not supposed to do this, but uh, is there any project that you're working on right now that's really exciting you? Yeah. So next spring, I actually in March, I have a book coming out called Whale Fall: Exploring a Ocean Floor Ecosystem. So a whale fall when a so a gray whale lives for about seventy years, but after it dies and its body falls to the ocean floor, it supports a community of life for another fifty years. And we're talking thousands of species, millions of individual organisms that all depend on this uh, whale as it is slowly decaying. The water down at the ocean floor is very cold. And so uh, decomposition happens more slowly. And so, and because whales weigh 70,000 pounds, there's a lot of meat there. There's a lot to fuel that ecosystem. So I'm really excited to bring that to life yeah. for kids. Yeah, boy, boy, whales are certainly huge. There's, I, I've seen them in the ocean, of course, but I also had the opportunity to perform at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, and and I performed in their foyer, and they have the skeleton of a whale hanging from the ceiling. So I actually performed underneath the skeleton of a whale, and it was just ginormous and just. Um, overwhelming just crazy they are gigantic i guess i have something about big creatures going on right I, now <laughs> yeah you do well you've had something about a lot of creatures and a lot of a lot of aspects of life and science where can people go to find all of the books that you've written over the years yeah i think you can go to your independent bookstore right now they make a great holiday gift um, but you can, if you don't have an independent bookstore near you, you can always uh, use Amazon or bookshop.org, which is another online selling uh, group. Also, there's a, a new website that's exciting called Bookalicious, where kids can make emojis that sort of represent all their different interests. And based on that information, the, there's an algorithm at the website that will suggest books that the kids might be interested in. So that's, that's a fun website to check out. Ooh, ooh. And is there a website people can go to to find out more about you? Yes, I have a website, and it's melissa-stewart.com. You can also just Google Melissa Stewart author, and it will pop right up. We've had a great time speaking about mega predators of the past and the author of the book, Melissa Stewart. Hey, Melissa, thanks for being back with us. Thank you. It's been fun. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be David Ezra Stein. He'll be here to celebrate his brand new graphic novel, Beaky Barnes, Egg on the Loose. Hey, if you are the author of a fantastic children's book, whether it's a picture book, middle grade novel, graphic novel, even a YA title, please be sure to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the author's click here button at the top of the page to learn how we can help you celebrate your book to the world. So many ways we can help you celebrate. You can be a guest here on the podcast. You can submit your book to our certified great read panel, and you can take part in our monthly promotion program. You can learn all about that and more by going to our website, readingwithyourkids.com, clicking on that author's click here button at the top of the page. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Chris, we're going to start by thanking our guest, Melissa Stewart. Please be sure to check out Mega Predators of the Past. I also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Mirabella Q, Jordan Saley, Stephanie Davila, Skylar Strauss, I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking part in our show today. And thanks you so much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of The Reading With Your Kids Podcast.